If you are familiar with Karl Marx, who's pictured here, then there's a pretty good chance that you associate his name and his philosophies with those of communism. Uh, and in fact, communism is, is in many ways rooted in Marxism, uh, but, but Marxism existed before that and really does, is not completely defined by communism or socialism. Marxism really, at its heart, has to do with, as much as anything, class and the economic realities exi that exist between those classes, the social classes and the opportunities and the perspectives that are affected by um, the economic realities of a social class. So that's what we're really going to examine as we look into, in this video, Marxist analysis of critical media studies. Remember, in critical media studies, we're using these different perspectives and outlooks to examine different artifacts um, using that particular pr perspective. We're not endorsing this perspective. We're just trying to use it to understand uh, how we could view that artifact in a different way. So with that, let's take a look at what, what is Marxist analysis. First of all, Marxist analysis examines artifacts from the perspective of class differences and the implications of the capitalist system. Um, and that's all tied together in Marxism. There, there, the, the capitalist system and economic realities really uh, are strongly reflected in the class differences and, and, and magnify those things and, and, and really have a deterministic effect uh, on what happens in those classes. Then, So we're going to examine the artifacts then from the perspective of those class differences and the implications of the capitalist system. So the major premises of Marxism begin with the fact that the economic realities in Marxism are greater than other ideologies. Economic realities, your, your financial situation, your economic realities, and that will be reflected in your social class then, obviously is going to outweigh every other consideration in your life. It's going to be greater than your religious ideologies. It's going to be greater than your political philosophies and ideologies. It's going to be greater than your moral philosophies in many ways, according to Marxism, right? But, but the economic realities, we come right back down to it to think about, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the root of these things, the root of, you know, how do we get shelter and food and water and those things we need to survive at the base level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We get those things through economics, right? And, and, and finances and money. So the economic realities then outweigh, according to Marxism, outweigh every other ideology. They are, they are the most significant aspect of our, of our, of our lives in many ways. Because of this, then there's a constant conflict between the, the social classes, which are really economic classes, right? The, the lower, the middle, the upper class, or however you want to divide it, that there are different classes of people there, the haves and the have nots and, and everything in between, right? So, uh, but because of these economic realities, it creates constant conflict between these classes. And there's, there's going to be constant conflict there, and there's going to be friction uh, in these instances, that this is then reflected in all forms of expression would be natural for Marxism. That if this is the, the guiding philosophy of our life or the most important thing, the base thing in our life, then of course it's going to be reflected in everything that we do, including the things that we create. Um, and so this is not exclusive to the, to, you know, artistic creation, but including everything that we do, everything we say, everything we write, everything we paint, or all the music that we create, the films that we create, all of these things express in some way, the economic reality of a particular class or have a message about that, the different classes and represent that conflict and can be viewed from that perspective. So uh, one of the, the, the primary questions in Marxism under the major premises is, first of all, who does this benefit? Who does this artifact benefit not only in the economic reality of who's making money, but also in their message of that, of that ideology, which, which class are they, um, uh, boosting up and supporting and, and, uh, and, and idealizing in this work and this artifact. And so who does it benefit both in a literal sense, in an economic sense, and also in a more figurative sense in, in, in the long run, in terms of who does it benefit outside of even the economic sense. And then the other question that's oftentimes asked in Marxist analysis is how are the lower classes oppressed by this? The uh, Marxist philosophy is that the lower classes, of course, are oppressed by the upper classes, by every class above them, wherever you're at in that you know, range. And if you're at the lowest possible part of the lowest class, then you're going to be the most oppressed. Um, so there's no question. The question is not, are they being oppressed? Are the lower classes being oppressed? The question is, how are they being oppressed? And how are they being affected negatively by this artifact in some way? In a contemporary perspective, there are a couple of additional things that we that we recognize in Marxist analysis and look at in Marxist analysis. Um, first is the profit motive influences and, or that, sorry, that profit motive influences 
media creation and practices. In the end, the media is a business, right? Media entities are a business. They're not there for public benefit necessarily. It's not a charity. There's not, you know, it's a business. Every, every, you know, when they make a film, they're not doing it just for their own, you know, fun. They're making it to make money. There's a business there. There's a business behind TV shows and even, you know, even cable news and, and network news, any kind of news program. They're there to make money as well. They, they want to sell advertisements. They want to make money. That's not a criticism of the media, by the way, from me. That's just the reality of the situation. Media is a business. We wouldn't expect any other business to, to operate in the negative just to have a public benefit. I mean, there's, there's charities to do that, right? They're nonprofits, but media entities are not nonprofits. These are businesses. And so their profit motive influences what they create, who they create it for, and all of their practices, right? And so that influences then, of course, their current practices uh, and current things that are happen happening in the media landscape. Uh, things like concentration of media. You see, more and more media owned by fewer and fewer companies and fewer and fewer entities, really some of the, the big ones. And this is almost a little bit dated now, but, but, uh, but uh, you know, think about uh, you know, Comcast, NBC owns Comcast, NBC universal owns tons of different media and media outlets, not only cable systems, but they own obviously the NBC network, they own MSNBC and CNBC and Peacock, the streaming network. And they own, uh, the, at one point owned a piece of Hulu, I think. And, and so and they own all this stuff. Viacom owns all these different entities, right? And CBS and Viacom own all these different entities together. And so now we see all these, these merging, this merging of things, right? And this concentration of media under a couple of different umbrellas, organizational umbrellas, instead of having lots of different media owned by all kinds of different people with lots of different competition, which we know is important in a free market system to have that competition. But there's also something to be said about the efficiency of, of, of uh, owning, you know, lots of different things and having this concentration of media. So there, there are positives and negatives to all of this, but that is a reality of the current practice in media is that there's a huge concentration of media. A few entities own like 90% of the media that you're going to watch. There's also a lot of conglomeration. Like we were just talking about, there's a lot of, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, again, working as an umbrella. So we know, and this is again, changed a little bit. AT&T doesn't own this organization anymore, but, uh, but discovery and HBO are owned by the same company. And then they own all these other, I mean, they're, they're all connected, this conglomeration. So they're all connected. You see a lot of cross pollination between these things. And, and so, uh, you know, again, there's positives and negatives. The positives are there's, they're sharing resources so that there's more efficiency there and they can ostensibly create more and better media theoretically uh, and do those things. But, uh, but at the same time, there, it's very homogenous. You're not getting a lot of diversity in the ownership of media. And so you're not getting a lot of diversity in the output of that media. People are you're going to be playing it safe. They're going to be playing to the widest possible, widest possible, possible audience, uh, which oftentimes is the whitest possible audience, right? Because that's where they feel again, coming back to the profit motive area. That's where they feel like the money's at. They feel like, you know, People in, they want to appeal to people in those upper level income classes because that's where they're going to get more money from for their advertisers, which is going to in turn produce more advertising dollars for them. So lots of things go into that it's effective concentration and conglomeration. We also see the impact then through efforts of integration, right? All of this is, is kind of leading and in influencing integration. We look at, for example, uh, Disney owns both ABC and ESPN. So we see a lot of conglomeration or a lot of integration between those things, right? Now you have ESPN crews working Monday night football and, and Sunday night football for ABC. And you have the, the ESPN broadcast on ABC. So they're, they're playing on the fact that ESPN is known for sports. So they're ABC is borrowing from that and integrating ESPN into their own sports uh, entities um, to, to, to provide some um, you know, credibility and, and use the personalities there to cross pollinate those personalities. You also see ESPN broadcast a lot of specials from, Disney facilities because they're owned by Disney. That's no mistake that they're doing that. So, and you can see right there, five Walt Disney company platforms kick off the 2021 Monday night football season in this, in this instance, right? So, um, so you see a lot of cross pollination there. You also see it, uh, in a lot of integration through things like the new streaming networks. We see Disney, Disney plus, um, has, 
Pixar and Disney and Marvel and Star Wars and National Geographic and all these things now integrated into this one thing. Well, Disney then also, of course, because they own ESPN, they have ESPN Plus and Hulu. Now you can buy that package, right? You can buy that package of things together and get a discount if you, rather than buying them independently, but they, they integrate all of these things together and try and sell them together because again, there's this conglomeration, there's a concentration of media that leads to this conglomeration and then this integration, right? And we see this affecting everyday media practices as well. For example, if you recall, for years, the office was the biggest broadcast or biggest streaming um, program on Netflix for a long, long time. Netflix had the office when it was kind of um, not very well known. And then all of a sudden it blew up and everybody was watching. It was, became the most streamed um, <clears throat> show in in the history of the world, I think, at some point. Well, then, of course, the office ran on NBC, though, and NBC owned the rights to the office and they had sold them to Netflix for a period of time. But when that contract was up, NBC decided to take the office back and put it on their own streaming platform. So now you can't watch the office on Netflix anymore. You have to watch it on Peacock because that's owned by NBC. We have this integration, bringing it back home into, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the, the NBC world so that NBC can benefit more from it. However, there are probably fewer people watching Peacock, although maybe some of them jumped over there to Peacock because they wanted to access the office. That's kind of the idea. They're trying to pull people into their own things here. Right? So we see that integration with, uh, along with the concentration and the conglomeration of, of uh, sources there. We have the integration of media. We also see a lot more multinationalism happening within the media. Um, one example of this is America's Got Talent. A huge program here in the United States. America's Got Talent brings in people from all over the world, the judges from all over the world. And, and so, but uh, uh, it was such a big hit here. They decided, wow, well, if we can do this here, you know, there are a lot more countries in the world than America, right? So they, they decided well, we can just do this anywhere. We can do this in Slovakia. We can do it in Germany. We can do it in Myanmar. We can do it in, in everywhere, right? So almost every country has their own fill in the blank, got talent show, right? Whatever your country is, got talent. Um, and we see them coming back together for, of course, of course the champions or, or AGT all-stars. They bring in and promote the fact that they have all these shows all over the world. So now we're, we're, we're exporting media uh, to different parts of the world as well. That's a contemporary media practice that has significant impact on the economics and, and, uh, and, and how it's represented, how these things are represented, how classes are represented and the appeal of those different classes, you know, the desire to get to a different class is represented, which is again important in our discussion here in, in terms of Marxism. So there are a few common questions I want to look at, just general questions I want to look at before we apply this to a specific artifact and, and try and see what this looks like. But so some of the common questions that we ask in Marxist analysis include things like, whom does this benefit? If the work is or effort is accepted or successful or believed or whatever, who does this benefit? Whom does this benefit? Whom individually or whom as an organization and what class and things of what social class is the author? Right? Who, where is this author from? And that's going to affect their perspective on how it's put together, how it's written, how it's packaged and, and what it hopes to accomplish. What class does the work claim to represent? So, you know, you could have the author from one social class, but claiming to represent a different social class and how does that uh, impact things and what perspective does that bring? What values does this work reinforce or subvert? So what values of that particular class, whatever class it claims to represent, what values does it reinforce about that? And what does it try and contradict about that class or what, you know, common conceptions we might have about that class? And what conflict can be seen between the values of the work champions and those it portrays. So where's the dichotomy there? Uh, is what, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're experiencing, is that representative of that class or is it different? And how is it? Uh, so what, what's the difference between the values of the work that it claims to be, the claims to champion and the work that it actually, and the, you know, what it actually shows then. So I want to try and apply this information to a specific artifact. Now okay, we're going to you know, look at these general questions, look at these same questions and apply it to something specific. And to be honest, I just went to the billboard hot 100 and found the number one song uh, right now. So it's dating this, uh, this video a little bit right now, but uh, the number one song at the moment, uh, unfortunately for me, because I'm not really a fan is uh, flowers by Miley Cyrus. 
Uh, so, you know, this is a big hit song. A lot of people know it. Um, and, and I've watched it a few times and tried to dig into it a little bit. Now, this is going to be a fairly superficial analysis. If you were doing a real analysis of this artifact, you would go much, much deeper than I am. But I did watch the video a few times and have tried to, uh, to, to answer some of these questions. So let's take a look at these questions as they relate to flowers and apply the framework of these questions to flowers by Miley Cyrus. So again, those common questions, let's go through them one by one as we look at this with, with, uh, Miley Cyrus here. Uh, whom does it benefit if the work is accepted, successful, believed, etc.? So first and foremost, I mean, this is a, this is a song and it's a, I mean, it's a production, it's a song, it's a video, it's on an album. It's, it's all kinds of things like that. So it benefits Miley Cyrus. She's the artist. That's fair, right? She created it. She performs it. She put it out. It benefits her, benefits her record company and, and those who work with her, not just her record company, but those who you know, work with her in terms of uh, you know, her stylist, her assistants, her, who, whoever directed the video and who did, whoever was a part of putting this product together, it benefits them. Theoretically, they were paid for their work. And, and so if it's successful, it benefits them as well and enhances their work. Um, you know, conceptually, because of what the song's about, theoretically, it could, it could, it could benefit, I guess, women, uh, in, in a sense, it's about it's sort of about female, uh, self-empowerment right the fact that she can do this on her own she doesn't need somebody else for all these things she can buy herself flowers she can do all these other things uh so it could theoretically um benefit um the effort of of empowerment of of women and independence of of women in society so um so there's that too could benefit you know not just in a financial sense but could benefit others in that way so i mean there are lots of different people that it could benefit if it's accepted uh, but you know the primary beneficiary would be miley cyrus uh, because it's going to promote her career and, and her artistry and things and uh, but secondarily then would be her anybody who benefits financially record company and, and those people who work for her uh, and then you know extends out from there What's, what's the social class of the author? I would say Miley Cyrus is a fairly, uh, you know, it's toward the top of the social class in terms of, um, in terms of economics. Um, you know, not only is she a successful artist at this point, uh, and has, you know, been, uh, you know, an actress and, and performer for many, many years now, but she comes from her dad, Billy Ray had this one hit wonder, uh, achy breaky heart. If you remember that back from my day. Um, so, I mean, they were, they were, they, they were presumably fairly well off, you know, not, not destitute. Uh, and then she's made a lot of money over time. So her social class, I would say is of the, the upper class. She's an upper class, um, uh, person and, and that of privileged society. I don't think that's much of a leap there. What class does the work claim to represent? You know, I, I would say it claims to represent, I guess just from the visuals in the, in the video, it claims to represent the upper class because, you know, most of the things she's doing and, and wearing are fairly high class. Um, so economically, I would say it's, it's, it represents the upper class, but really it's not class oriented in that sense. It, it's intended, I think, again, as a, as a, as an anthem of women's empowerment. And so not an economic, um, situation like that. So, um, but, but certainly everything that's in the uh, thing tends to look so what class does this work claim to represent if we examine that question you know i think it's fair to say this class she's not claiming to represent um, a lower class she's she's upper class herself and and she tends to represent that in this video i think in terms of what she's wearing her style the locations that they use are, are fairly uh upper class they're they're pretty pretty fancy you know she's not claiming to represent the lower class i would say more broadly she's she's claiming to represent the cla a class of women and the independence and empowerment of women in general um so if, if we're to look at a class in that respect um then she certainly represents is claiming to represent women who are independent and can you know and value that independence but uh but I don't think, you know, she's claiming to represent a lower economic class. It's pretty fairly evident that she's part of the claim is that she can do it on her own. She doesn't need anybody else. She's got all this stuff she can. And she, she did that on her own and she doesn't need anybody else uh, for any of that. So what values does this reinforce and or subvert? Uh, I think it reinforces the values of again, women's empowerment, that women can do things on their own, that they don't need 
a partner, a man specifically, or a partner in general to accomplish these things. They can, uh, they can do that. They can get rich. They can, they can make their own money. They can, um, you know, have all these nice things through their own efforts and, and their own power. Right. Um, what values does it subvert? Um, and, and does it, uh, does it, uh, contradict, I guess, I, I don't know the, the idea that, um, that if you don't have these things, then that, that you're not doing what you should be doing, I guess, or, or not, not empowering yourself and that you're failing in some way in that regard. Um, so it kind of contrary, you know, undermines those types of things that, that says that if you don't have these things, maybe you're not doing something right, I guess, um, you know. That, that to me is my own perception, my own perspective of this. And that's, that's, you know, that's what I'm bringing, I guess, to this analysis. And then what conflict can be seen between the values of the work champions and those it portrays? Again, the idea that, that you can, yes, you can buy yourself flowers. You can do all these things on your own. You also had a little bit of a head start, Miley. So uh, it's not like you were destitute before all of this, right? You had a little bit of, of advantage, a little bit of privilege in that regard. Um, so, th th so there's a little bit of conflict there, I think, in terms of, Yes, women can do all these things, uh, but certainly uh, some women have, you know, just in, in all forms of life, some people have a privilege over others. That's something we've been recognizing now in our societies that some people you know, come with that privilege and, and have that privilege, have that stronger foundation to begin with. And I think that's true here that, yes, you can do all these things and women absolutely can do all these things and, and, and should be uh, encouraged to, uh, to, to be individually independent and empowered. But at the same time, it's a little easier when you when you start with, you know, the wealthy head. Not that she hasn't worked hard, but uh, when you start with the from a from a the upper class perspective, that does provide some advantages uh, to doing these types of things. So, so anyway, that's my analysis, of my you know, uh, you know, armchair analysis of Miley Cyrus's flowers using the Marxist analysis and looking at it from an economic sense and and those types of things. So uh, almost crossing over see a little bit into the feminist criticism and things, but uh, but there's always a lot of crossover in these things. Hopefully this gives you an idea of what Marxist analysis is about and how it can be applied. Um, I hope this is helpful to you in, in understanding it even just a little bit more. Certainly we're only scratching the surface here, but just trying to provide some perspective on what we're looking at in terms of Marxist analysis. If you have questions about this analysis or any other kind of analysis, please feel free to contact me. I'd love to hear from you via email and we can chat about it there. In the meantime, I hope that you will continue to, to examine things critically through Marxist analysis and all the other different types of analysis that we'll be discussing in these videos.